Next, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Wadella, who's been writing code since before she realized it was actually a credible career path. Uh, she works with us at Batovi as a JavaScript developer, and she loves building performant web apps, speaking at technical conferences, and brewing kombucha. Yes, kombucha. Uh, today, she's going to show us how to write clean reactive forms in Angular with the control value access interface. All right. A uh, control value accessor, like a wormhole in space for your forms, only more useful. Uh, the theme of ng-conf this year was space-themed, um, so hence the kind of joke of this talk is um, all about wormholes and the control value accessor. Um, so first of all, if you don't know what a wormhole is, uh, they are theoretical, but um, they are envisioned as some sort of space-time tunnel that's connecting two points separated um, in space and time. And so technically they say, all right, black holes are on either side of a wormhole connecting those two. And it's kind of cool because we've actually seen a photo of our first black hole now. Um, so very exciting times. Um, but again, theoretically, this is what a wormhole is visualized as. We've got two black holes on either side, and then we've got some sort of like tunnel structure essentially bending space and time. Um, again, very theoretical, but the problem is these are theorized to be very, very unstable um, and have some really unfortunate side effects that can happen. Kind of scary. Uh, fortunately, the control value accessor does not have any scary side effects that I am aware of. Um, no demogorgons popping out, anything like that. Uh, but the control value accessor is an Angular interface that acts as a bridge between the Angular Forms API and a native element in the DOM. Um, we can use this for, uh, you know, creating really powerful uh, form control directives that integrate really, really nicely with forms. Uh, so if we were to kind of visualize what this looks like, uh, we've got our, you know, um, wormhole diagram that we've got here where we've got our form uh, is one side of this tunnel and then we've got our custom directive that's implementing our control value access or interface on the other side and in between we're able to pass values and, and different information throughout this. So that's kind of what we're working with here. Uh, I've got a sample app to kind of make this a little more easily illustrated and so it's a application where we can read different galaxies and so there is a type ahead drop down. Uh, once we've selected that type ahead drop down then we can actually go through and set a rating on our galaxy and then enter our name if our, we so desire. <clears throat> Uh, so we've got a couple things going on here. Um, we need custom components that are going to kind of act as these elements in our in our reactive form. We've got our type head component, um, and here's where we want to um, be displaying some sort of readable value to our user, but we might have an ID or something tied to this that we want to be submitting as our form value. So that's problem number one. Uh, and then problem number two is we want the star rating component where um, we've got like this very interactive UI uh, and we wanna make sure that we're passing some sort of value when we make a selection of this, this star rating. So that's the scenario we're gonna be working with. Uh, so quick reactive forms crash course, if you're not familiar, reactive form is a model driven approach to handling form inputs whose values change over time. Uh, our form controllers are very basic building blocks. So this is your input or your radio or your select element. It's going to represent a piece of data in, in your form as a whole. Uh, we've got our form group, which is a way we can manage a group of form controls. Uh, and we also have our form control name, which is a directive that ties the form element to the form control. Uh, you might have just seen um, form control directive. Uh, form control name does a, a name lookup, and so sometimes it's a little bit more readable, and it's, so it's the directive that I prefer to use. Um, so we might have a sample reactive form like this. Uh, where we've got our, our galaxy form group, and inside of here we've got a form control for our galaxy, a form control for our rating, and a form control for our name. Um, and you'll notice that our rating form control is disabled by default. We only want this to be enabled when um, our galaxy form control has a value, so we've got a little business requirement around that. Uh, and so when we're putting the, the markup together for our form, this is what we're going to have it look like, uh, where I've created these uh, custom directives. So you can see GR type ahead and GR star rater are my custom components that um, I've created that I'm going to use the control value access or interface in. Uh, and you might be thinking, um, okay, well, Jennifer, I don't understand like why this is such a big deal. Like I can just put an input event on my thing. I can bind a change event to it and then I can output that a value and I can have some sort of listener in my parent form component. Um, and then I can listen on that change and then I can just set the value inside my form like problem solved. Okay, whatever. Um, We've got a couple pitfalls with this approach though. For one, we're having to manage all these additional methods for listening to change events. Um, and that's just a lot of extra code to manage and, and change over time. Uh, <clears throat> 
we're having to use this additional method of patch value on our form control to actually set that value or do all sorts of changes. And how would we even begin to validate this in a reasonable way? Um, Angular has a lot of really great built-in default validation that we can take advantage of and have to write very, very minimal code as long as we understand what we're doing. All right, so if we take my approach, the control value accessor approach, uh, this is what this is going to look like. And before we get into this, we need to understand um, what this interface is and, and how we're going to be using it. Uh, so quick reminder, with TypeScript, with classes and interfaces, if there's a class implementing an interface, it must follow the structure described by the interface. So that means all the methods that are required and that are not optional must be implemented in the class um, that's extending this interface. And I feel like a lot of people have gotten hung up on this and they're seeing error messages because they don't understand that they're working with an interface and, and need to be implementing it as so. Um, so we've got a couple of required methods. The first one is write value. Um, and this is what's going to write a value to the element. And it's going to be called on two different occasions. One, when the form control is first instantiated, so when we're calling new form control. Um, and then again, when we're either calling patch value or set value um, that would be modifying that form control. So if we go back to our analogy of this wormhole, um, okay, so on the, on the yellow um, side, we have our component that is implementing um, the control value access interface. And it's going to be displaying something in the UI. Let's say it's my name. Um, when we're creating that form control on the other side, um, where, our, where our main form is, we're creating that form control and we're setting the value to be Jennifer. And so that's how our control value accessor component is getting that value to display. Um, so it's getting that on the, again, initialization of the form control. And then if I am making an update to that, let's say I call name.patch value, um, it'll get that update as well. So that's when that method will be called. The next method we have is register unchanged. Um, and this is a callback function that's going to be called when the controls value changes in the UI. Uh, and so if you think about um, dealing with forms, of course, we're going to want to know when a value changes because that's going to uh, change the value of the form, for instance. If we have a form control that is required uh, and we don't have a, a value in it, then it's going to show as an invalid status. But if we update that to give it a value, then we want to make sure that that status is being updated to be valid. Um, so kind of that's, that's why we need to care about this change event to let the um, parent form Know what's going on. So in this instance, let's say we trigger some sort of change event um, inside of our form. So if we look at this uh, Galaxy rating app, for instance, anytime I'm clicking on a star, that's some sort of event that I want to be emitting change on, right? Um, so we're going to go ahead, we're going to call on change, we're going to pass it a value, uh, and then if we're subscribing to value changes of that form control in our parent form, that's where we're going to get that value. So our, our um, change event is passing that value through our little control value access or wormhole, um, so our form control can, can hear about that change. Uh, next, we have register untouched. So similar to um, on change, we want to know when a, a form control has been interacted with. Um, this is why we have blur functionality, so you can know that it's been interacted with to let a user know what's going on. Again, a lot of this plays into um, showing validation and giving the user a really nice experience on interacting with their form. Um, so we want to make sure that we're calling this function whenever somebody is interacting with our form control. Uh, looking at our type ahead instance, um, if we were to just click in it but not select an event, that would be an example of where we'd want to call a blur event to say, okay, this has been touched, it's been interacted with, and let our, our parent form know about that. Um, so with our, our diagram here, we've got our untouched method that we're, we're calling, we've got this touch event. Um, and so then our form control, which is going to have a property of touched, is now going to be um, set to true. And so if we have any sort of validation or logic or handling around that, we, we have that information. And then finally, for this interface, we have an optional method, which is set disabled state. So you do not have to use this one. Um, but if you want to be able to um, control what your form looks like when it's disabled, you will need this. Um, so this is going to be called when the form control is instantiated, if the disabled key is present, and when enable or disable is called on that form control. Um, so here we, we are calling disable on our form control um, and the true value is getting passed to our set disabled state method and so we can do anything with that and I'll show you um, kind of what that looks like inside this example. Um, so a couple of things when we go to actually implement a um, component or directive that's uh, using the control value accessor interface, uh, we need to register the ng value accessor provider um, and implement the methods. Uh, basically, this is going to register it early, and so we need to have uh, a way to reference it. So this is kind of what that setup of code is going to look like. Um, with passing the provider, using forward ref to refer to the component um, in case it does not exist when we're, when we're needing to use it. 
Okay, so basic implementation is going to look like this. Um, I've got a, a value um, member set that I'm, I'm just using to hold whatever value that I can be interacting with, same with disabled. Um, and then I am basically um, setting up all these different functions. And then you can see in my template, I've got a change event tied to my input. When that fires, I'm going to call my on touched event and my on change event with a new value. Okay, uh, basic setup there. Um, and then inside of our form, uh, this is where it gets really cool because when we um, thought about that first approach of how to handle this problem, we've got these different like change events that we're listening to. We can treat this just like you would set up a normal form control where we're just passing in form control name to tie it to our form control. Um, that's what that's going to look like. And that's, this is the same syntax, this form control name directive that I prefer is the exact same as doing form control, my form .controls name. It's just an easier way to iterate through when you're dealing with form groups, which is a pretty common scenario. Um, okay, so if we're back to our original um, Galaxy rating application and how do we use this to build our type ahead and our rating form controls, um, we're going to have this sort of type ahead that we want to uh, make sure that we are um, provide or showing one value and then submitting a different value. Uh, so if we have some data that looks like this, we've got our name, though, which we want to display to the user, but let's say all we care about saving in our form is the ID. This is kind of a setup that you might have seen before. Um, so inside of my component, um, I am just going to use uh, a type ahead library. I use NGX Bootstrap a lot. Um, so this is going to give me markup for how to implement this type ahead. You're normally binding these different things to this input class that's going to generate this nice type ahead code for you. Um, I've got a template here that's just showing the model name instead of that whole object um, in the form. And then uh, a couple events here that are built in um, from this, this type of head, or you've probably seen this pattern before where there's gonna be an on a select, you can fire an on select function, the same with on blur. Um, so those tie into the way we wanna be implementing our methods inside of the control value accessor. Um, so here we go. So let's look at this on select event first. So this is you know built into the type of head. Once I've selected an option, it's gonna fire this, um, this method. Um, and then here I'm gonna go ahead, mark my um, untouched, uh, method. And then if there is an ID, I'm going to go ahead and um, call my onChanged function to um, have that value of the ID. So the form control that this is representing is aware of that change. Same thing with Rumbler. I'm going to fire an onTouched event. And just because type of heads are a little um, tricky, I want to make sure that if something has been deselected or something like that, I'm updating to say there's no longer a value with null. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, let's move on to our rating component. And this one is a little bit interesting because this is not an actual, you know, um, HTML form element that we're used to dealing with. Um, so I've got some code that looks like this. I'm repeating these different stars and it's just an SVG that I have a click event on. Um, and so I have a click event set rating that's gonna be whatever that rating is and some just interesting display text. Um, so inside here again, I'm just tying to that click event uh, and then I'm saying, okay, uh, you know, if this is, not disabled because I'm uh, enacting my own disabled functionality. I want to call that changed event with whatever the star rating is and trigger the untouched. And then this is a use case where, um, remember I said before that if uh, we don't have a value in here that we don't want this to be enabled. Um, so if we, uh, let me just refresh this real quick. Um, so we want to make sure that this isn't interactable. And so I'm kind of having to implement my own disabled functionality here to make sure nothing happens. Um, so that's why I have some of this code where I have a class of disabled where I am handling the stars being grayed out and I've got my, my cursor changing uh, to make sure to let the user know that you can't interact with this at this point. Um, so that's when the being able to get the disabled state matters. Um, and then if the disabled state changes, I'm changing that and then you can then interact with the components. So that's kind of what that setup would look like. Um, when it comes to testing our components, there are a couple things we care about. Uh, wormholes aren't unit testable. Control value accessor components are, so yay for us. Um, we want to make sure that our components um, implementing our CVM methods communicate with the form control uh, in the way we're expecting. We want to make sure that setting and displaying values when the form control is initialized with its value um, gets its value updated. Uh, we want to make sure that our disabling and enabling works correctly. Um, and then interacting with the components sets our validation classes as expected. Um, so Angular under the hood, um, when you touch uh, some sort of form control, it's going to set a bunch of classes on that that you can use to display different validation. Um, so we'll set ng untouched, ng dirty, and so those are the kind of things that we want to make sure stay in sync um, 
So we can use these as, as normal form controls and not reinvent the wheel when Angular has done a lot of work for us already. Um, so test setup, um, it can be kind of tricky. So in this case, I like to create a test host component um, and use ViewChild to reference my actual type ahead component. So that way I can have um, what's going on in the parent, which is where our form control is initialized. Um, to make sure the value changes are happening there, but then I can also interact with my actual component implementing the control value accessor to do that. Um, so this is a, a great approach for this kind of situation where you kind of need to be testing those two pieces in sync to make sure you're getting your desired results. Um, first thing I care about, I want to make sure that um, my change event is emitting the value I'm expecting. Um, so in here I'm interacting with my type ahead component um, and I'm calling the on select method with some data, uh, calling detect changes, which is going to run, um, you know, Angular change detection. Uh, and then I'm going to make sure that my form control, which has been implemented in my um, parent test host component, has the value that it's expected to. Uh, next, want to test um, touch events and validation. So again, uh, when I talked about making sure that we are um, emitting touch events and then getting the classes we're expecting to see that Angular should be setting for us, um, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to do some sort of change event, um, dispatch that event, uh, and then make sure that my um, components class list for that form control that I've been manipulating contains the, the classes that should be there. In this case, ng invalid should be true because I'm emitting um, an event where uh, one of my required fields doesn't have a value. Uh, I want to test set value to make sure that when I'm making changes to my form control, that my component implementing the control value accessor interface for that form control is getting those changes. So in this case, um, I've got my form control, I'm calling patch value, setting a value on it. And I want to make sure that um, my type ahead um, selected property, whatever selected for that, um, has the value that I'm expecting. Uh, I want to test my reading change events, uh, kind of similar that we've looked at before, uh, to make sure that our value has been updated. Uh, and then finally, want to look at testing disabling. So in this case, remember when I had that star rater disabled, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't able to be interacted with. So in this case, I've got a disabled star um, control. I am clicking on it. I don't want anything to happen with that click event if it's working properly, which means the um, parent component uh, with the form controls value should not change. Uh, so key concepts, uh, the control value accessor is really great for granular control of displaying one thing to the UI while communicating something different to the forms API. Uh, we want to keep our wrapper components dumb. A lot of times when people start to use this, they're not sure where to put their logic or their validation. Um, keep your components really dumb. They're just going to input and output values, essentially. Um, so leave your validation and your logic and any sort of handling to wherever that form control is being initialized. Um, <clears throat> Leave validation logic again to that parent form component uh, and understand that um, the control value accessor can be used with any form API, including template driven. Um, I feel like a lot of the use cases tend to be more in using the reactive forms API, but um, if you run into a scenario, you can use this with template driven forms as well. Um, the slides are available here. I know that was a lot of content to run through. Um, and if you're somebody like me who likes to be really, really hands on and playing um, with the code, I've got uh, the demo code available in this repo with those tests included.